Hello everyone. Today is World Diabetes Day. So we as a team of Shankara today would be enlightening you with a few tips on diabetic awareness and diabetic retinopathy and its screening and the importance. The theme for this World Diabetes Day is access to diabetes education. Do you know that worldwide, there are more than 500 million diabetics, adult population who are affected and more than 1 million children and adolescents who are suffering from diabetes. One out of every five diabetics are suffering from eye problem for, uh, causing diabetic retinopathy, which is the leading cause of blindness in these diabetic patients. One patient in every two seconds is being diagnosed with diabetes today. Isn't it a huge burden on all of us? So let us see how we can help to increase the awareness on diabetic retinopathy screening and reduce the blindness because of diabetic retinopathy. Uh, let me introduce our team. Today we have with us uh, Ms. Bhavya, Dr. Dev Kalichetti, Ms. Sri Lakshmi and uh, Ms. Rebecca Johnson as a part of Shankara team who would be giving you a talk, a small talk on awareness. Over to uh, Ms. Bhavya. Ms. Bhavya has done her uh, uh, Bachelor's of Optometry and Master's in Optometry and is working with Shankara Eye Hospital as a consultant and a faculty member over here since past seven years. Over to you, Ms. Bhavya. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, myself, Bhavya. Today, I'll be talking about importance of eye screening in diabetes patients. So, as we all know, diabetes is a sight-threatening disease. One individual out of five individuals are mostly affected by having diabetic retinopathy. So, this picture shows us how a normal retina looks like. So retina is the most integral structure wherein which is responsible for vision. And uh, in case of diabetic retinopathy, you would see the blood vessels that are being affected mostly. So the prevalence of diabetic retinopathy goes up to 21.7 percentage. And also the patients with diabetes, they develop eye diseases as complication. So it is also referred that uh, a comprehensive ophthalmological examination yearly is much required. So you can refer them to an ophthalmologist or an op optometrist for the examination. And for type 1 diabetes, 3 to 5 years from the onset or after 12 years mm -hmm. annually, it is recommended. And for type 2 and uh, gestational diabetes, it is at the time of diagnosis. So usually in the initial stages, the symptoms of diabetic retinopathy, it is asymptomatic. And in later stages, you start seeing fluctuating in the vision and also floaters and sometimes even scotomas are seen for the patient. So this is how the retina appears if it's left untreated. You get to see the microvascular changes. And in later stages, uh, it becomes sight-threatening if the retina appears to be like this. So who are at risk for diabetic retinopathy? So both type 1 and type 2 and also the gestational diabetes. Uh, the duration of diabetes mellitus like we discussed earlier. Also, we need to monitor the HbA1c level uh, to look into and monitor for diabetic retinopathy. Also, patients who are having uncontrolled diabetes, hypertension, obesity and smoking, nephropathy, and also individuals who are under insulin treatment. Now, looking at the importance of screening, any disease condition, if it is detected at an early stage, even before it is symptomatic, then the treatment outcomes would be better. So to treat the abnormal changes also that could develop in the later stages of uh, diabetic retinopathy, the screening plays a major role. Now, according to World Health Organization, so it has defined the criteria for evaluating population for the screening test. So the screening should be done only for diseases with serious consequences. As we all know, diabetic retinopathy has its own serious consequences as it is a sight-threatening disease condition if it is left untreated. 
and also the test should be reliable enough and not harmful in itself. Uh, so there should be an effective treatment for disease when detected at early stages. And also we have a lot of research evidences which acts as a scientific proof that treatment is more effective at the early stages. And also a neutral information should be provided to the public uh, to create the awareness about the screening and also the treatment importance. Thank you, everyone. I hope this was helpful for everyone. Thank you, Ms. Bhavya. Thank you so much. So now we have uh, Mr. Dev uh, Kalichetti with us. Mr. Dev has uh, completed his Bachelor's of Optum from LVPI and uh, done his Master's from Shankara College of Optometry. And he is currently pursuing PhD and working as Assistant Professor and Consultant Optometrist at Shankara Eye Hospital, Ludhiana. Uh, over to you, uh, Mr. Dev. Am I audible? Yeah, yes, you are. Yeah, sorry. Sorry for the mis uh, mis miscommunication. So, uh, as you all know that uh, on the world on the world diabetic day, we let us discuss about the screening options that are available for the diabetic retinopathy. Okay. So, first is let us understand what is the goal of screening a diabetic retinopathy patients. So, the majority of the patients who are suffering with diabetes are asymptomatic patients for diabetic retinopathy and it is a side threatening condition which can lead to visual blindness and visual impairment. So, if you can uh, catch hold of this condition at the earlier stage, you can prevent the visual impairment and blindness. So, that is the goal of uh, screening a diabetic retinopathy patients. So, what do we screen in diabetic retinopathy? So, to understand what do we screen, first we should understand what are the changes we are looking for. So, in diabetic retinopathy screening, basically your doctor or physician checks the uh, your retinal condition. It can be in five stages where proliferative diabetic retinopathy is the severe stage that you can see in the red color, whereas your severe non proliferative diabetic retinopathy and uh, previous stages were less dangerous for the side threatening. So the motto of screening in diabetic retinopathy is to catch hold of the disease at the earliest stage pos possible. So how to screen for a diabetic retinopathy? So what are the policy that to catch hold of this disease at the earliest stage? First step as per the World Health Organization is to identify the population eligible for screening at the earliest stage. So for this, we need to have a list of people in the population you want to screen that are suffering with diabetes at the first hand. So this is one of the crucial step where you need to get the list of the population who are suffering with diabetes in your area or population in which you are interested. The second step is to inv you invite them and give them information about the diabetic retinopathy screening that is going on. And to a reminder system, make sure that everyone is getting screened. And the third step is screening or testing itself. And we have multiple options for that. And I'm going to discuss them. What are the options that are available for screening in the coming few slides? And uh, after that, you have to refer the screen positive to the ophthalmologist and screen negatives has to be documented for the future referral system. So how often you have to refer, how often you have to go undergo diabetic retinopathy screen is one of the crucial question. Every patient who is having diabetes will have question. So if you're suffering with type one diabetes, you have to undergo after three to five years of initial diagnosis of your type one diabetes. If you are, if you have type two diabetes on the first, first retinal exam should be on the time of diagnosis and later on, on one yearly or by yearly, you can undergo a retinal screening and some women may have 
diabetes and may be pregnant and those have to go those those patients have to go for retinal exam soon after the conception and in the early in the first trimester to triage any uh, ad, uh, adverse reactions or adverse condition that of the diabetic retinopathy so nevertheless any person who is suffering with diabetes has to undergo retinal evaluation once or twice a year one once once a year or tw twice at least or a year at least per the effect to diabetes screening so let us uh, Talk about what are the screening options your doctor or physicians have for screening you for the diabetic retinopathy. So first option is a fundus examination. Uh, so uh, they take the photos of your fundus or they see examine with special equipment. Optical coherence tomography is a special instrument which they screen your macular if is there any thickening. And the latest screening techniques were automatic diabetic retinopathy image systems with the help of artificial intelligence, where you uh, they train the softwares to uh, detect the disease through mobile uh, mobile photography and everything. OCT angiography is one of the latest, where it is less invasive and you can uh, photograph the circulation of your retinal blood vessels. And smartphones for portable eye screening is one of the option. So let us discuss what is the advantage and disadvantage of each of these screening techniques. So if you can see direct ophthalmoscopy technique of fundus examination is very portable and really inexpensive. But as you can see in the picture, the area your doctor or physician can see is very limited and there is a high chances they can miss the, your diabetic retinopathy condition and you may have left out. So the second technique which your doctor may use is your indirect technique where you use a, a separate 20 adapter lens to look at a large field and it is very uh, portable again and it's really inexpensive. But the problem is it requires pupil dilation. So some of you may think what is the reason of pupil dilatation. So whenever you have to you have to be dilated your doctor needs to put a special drops into your eye. eye. Uh, which under his supervision. So this kind of screening cannot be done without an ophthalmologist intervention. The third gold standard technique is to use slit lamp and uh, 90 adapter lens. This is also, a, you can see a large field and it's really, uh, but the, it's a relatively expensive technique and requires pupil dilatation. So one of the ma major things uh, that is currently getting used is the retinal photography where a non-doctor, a non-technician can do and a large field, more than 30 degrees visual field can be filmed using a retinal photography. They are portable and they're auditable and retrospectively they can be retrieved and they can be stored and transformed. But that is a disadvantage of this technique is it's relatively expensive. And if it is non-meteorotic, if the photograph has to be filmed without putting drops into your eyeball, they may some, sometimes give poor images which cannot be readable or uh, interpreted by your doctor. So these are the, some of the uh, advances. And OCT can be used to uh, catch hold of your diabetic macular edema and circulation, which is a non-invasive process. This is also one of the latest techniques that are being used for screening diabetic retinopathy. So currently, uh, the future of diabetic retinopathy lies in the uh, artificial intelligence, where uh, the computers are getting fed with data to uh, detect diabetic retinopathy at early stage. So here you can see in this picture, smartphones can be used to capture the, along with the camera, the fundus image, which later was fed to a software, which can detect the diabetic retinopathy and refer without the uh, much load on the ophthalmologist. So these are the, some of the screening options that you will find out. And uh, once again, uh, on the occasion of diabetics, it, uh, I ask everyone to pledge an year, yearly eye checkup. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dev. Uh, that was a very nice explanation of uh, uh, explaining the importance in, of uh, a regular uh, screening. Uh, and thank you also for uh, emphasizing on the importance of getting a dilated examination because most often uh, all of us, when we go for an eye checkup, we just get our glasses done and we think that that's the end of the checkup. If you are a diabetic, a diabetic, please ensure that you get a dilated examination done because this will help us to uh, look into more details of our retina 
like identifying the small or the early changes which may go undetected if you are going for an undilated uh, direct ophthalmoscopic examination. Uh, the second most important thing is considering our large population in India and the diabetic burden. Not all of us might have access to a retina specialist. So uh, we are changing along with technology. Uh, many of the diabetologists, the endocrinologists are now having uh, um, portable fundus cameras like uh, Mr. Dev also explained that we are also using smartphone cameras. Many of these cameras have an integrated artificial intelligence system which help to identify a referable or an early diabetic retinopathy and also detect whether a patient requires a referral to the retina specialist or not or is at a risk of uh, developing a site threatening uh, diabetic retinopathy or not. So, uh, although we have limited resources, technology is also helping us in identifying and picking up retinopathy at early stages. So, it is very important that um, if you are a diabetic, go for a checkup, irrespective of what kind of uh, specialist you go. And at least a screening is a mandate. And then once the screening is done, uh, either the optometrist who is screening you or the diabetologist who is screening you or a general ophthalmologist, is, whoever is screening you, will let you know at what stage of risk you are and whether you need to seek a, a retina specialist opinion or not. But first of all, let us all pledge that we are going to get an annual eye checkup if we are diabetics. Uh, now, let me introduce our third speaker of the day today. Uh, Ms. Lakshmi, who has done her bachelor's in optometry and uh, from Shankara College of Optometry and then pursued her fellowship. She's currently working with us as a consultant optometrist at Shankara uh, Eye Hospital, Bangalore. Over to you, Ms. Uh, Lakshmi. Thank you, ma'am. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today I'll be talking about the diagnosis and management options in diabetic retinopathy. So what to expect? So once you come to the hospital, the one you will be consulting will be an ophthalmologist or a retina specialist. So uh, coming to the uh, diagnosis part, first and foremost, vision assessment and history taking will be done, where a detailed history will uh, help us to know about the uh, visual problems the patients will be facing like uh, the variable visual changes or any double vision the patient this. Uh, experiencing and also we will get to know about uh, the general health issues the patient is facing if the, obviously if the patient is diabetic how long the patient has been diagnosed with the condition what type of diabetes he has and what are the medications and all he's taking associated with the and, and, and other uh, general health issues we need to inquire about all that so we will get a general idea about the patient and coming to the vision assessment where we will get we had to know the central vision of the patient is affected, as well as absolute grid, which we will also see if the central vision is affected for the patient. And after that, a dilated retinal examination is done, but the patient's pupil is dilated, and the retina is um, examined by an ophthalmologist using an um, instrument called ophthalmoscope. From there, we will uh, get to know the state of the retina. So if you see here, the left-hand side is the earliest stage of the diabetic retinopathy, which is called as the non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And the right-hand side is the picture of the advanced, a bit advanced stage that is the uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So uh, from the fundus examination, <coughs> the ophthalmologists are going to get an idea regarding the retinal state. And also, uh, it's been told earlier, the stages of the diabetic retinopathy so the frequency of the follow-ups where the patient is asked to come back for a follow-up visit is also depend upon the stages of the diabetic retinopathy. Like if the patient is having a mild, not proliferative diabetic retinopathy, the patient is asked to come uh, purely once. And if the patient is having a moderate NPDR, the patient is asked to come once in six months. And if the patient is having a severe type of NPDR, the patient is asked to come once in three months. 
and in case of uh, the advanced stage that is the proliferative diabetic retinopathy stage the patient is asked to come on a weekly basis according to the severity of their condition so depend upon the fundus examination the further investigations are also advised by the ophthalmologist so which are color fundus photo where you can see here what a normal retina seems like and what a diabetic retinopathy retina seems like so we will get an idea from these pictures also in case of suspecting any uh, swellings in the retina uh, the upon advice for oct where we will get to know any edematous formations are there in the retina also uh, fundus fluorescent angiography is also advised in the advanced stages where uh, any leakage of blood vessels and all are suspected where uh, where a, a fluorescent stain is uh, injected into the patient's arm which travels through the venous um, the vasculature of the patient and which will which will reach the eye and pictures are captured from there we will get to know the uh, any blood leakages are there any new blood vessels which can be seen in the proliferative advanced stage proliferative diabetic retinopathy new vascular feature or any blockage leakage everything can be found out from the fluorescent angiography so coming to the management part of the diabetic retinopathy first and foremost we will ask the patient to control a strict diet and maintain a healthy lifestyle also to keep monitoring their blood glucose level and to take their medications on time and the other treatment option is a uh, laser treatment where the retinal, uh, retinal blood vessel leakages uh, are there we will use laser to uh, burn out the retinal vessels to cause further damages so next uh, option is uh, intravitreal injection which is basically anti vegf what these injections will do is they will help to prevent uh, the uh, formation of new blood vessels as well as to reduce the swelling in the retina so another uh, management option is surgical inter intervention that is vitrectomy where there is in the later stages when there is a vitreous hemorrhage or scar formation and consequently if there is a detachment of the retina we will uh, use this in intervention where the blood blood and the vitreous are taken out from the uh, retina so that the vision uh, which was disturbed because of the uh, blood as well as the detachment of the retina can be cured so coming to a conclusion you can see um, in the early stages for the management part in the early stages where the patient will be normally asymptomatic no intervention no treatment is uh, given it's only observation we will keep the patient in in case of macular edema injections or the laser is an op uh, management option in case of proliferative diabetic retinopathy but uh, hemorrhage is that blood leakage will be in the uh, retina there we can uh, use laser treatment as well as surgical intervention and in the advanced stage where the detachment of retina has happened we can go for the uh, vitrectomy that is the surgical procedure so that's all from my side thank you thank you miss uh, sri lakshmi uh... so uh, uh, we have a couple of uh, questions on our youtube channel uh, let us just take these questions so one of the question is how early can diabetes affect <laughs> eyesight uh, although usually uh, diabetes affects uh, diabetic retinopathy occurs a couple of years after the on onset of uh, diabetes uh, if your sugars are uncontrolled or if you have other risk factors like high hba1c uh, concomitant uh, hypertension uh, high cholesterol levels if you have gestational diabetes uh, if you have renal issues and if you are anemic all of these risk factors can cause an earlier uh, 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 incidence of uh, diabetic retinopathy uh, so yes it takes couple of years for diabetic retinopathy to affect your eyesight but if you are at risk then an early diabetic retinopathy screening is uh, advised coming to our next question 
can diabetic retinopathy still affect eyes even if sugars are under control uh, yes diabetic retinopathy can affect despite your sugars being uh, under control if you are diabetic for a very long time uh, the duration of diabetes is known to be a very strong risk factor for developing diabetic retinopathy so the longer you have diabetes the more at risk you are of developing diabetic retinopathy uh, coming to the next question uh, how many injections would one need in case of diabetic eye disease uh, this is a little difficult to answer because uh, the role of injection here is when a pe person develops swelling in the central part of the retina, which is called macular edema. That is the most common uh, indication where we advise uh, injection to, this pa uh, to these patients. So the injections help to reduce the swelling and usually the duration of the effect of the injection lasts either one to three months, depending on the kind of injection you are taking. But yes, as the injection effect wanes off, you might require multiple injections. So uh, probably um, five or more injections may be required in first year and the number of injections might slowly come down over the years. But the more number of injections that you have taken in the first year is known to be uh, giving better visual outcomes. Uh, coming to our uh, last question, after laser, when and how long to follow up and will these patients require retinal surgery after a laser treatment? So uh, I would like to emphasize here the, uh, to break the misconception that uh, diabetic retinopathy is not like cataract. It is not a one-time treatment that you take. Uh, if you are diagnosed with diabetic retinopathy, it is best that you follow up with your retina specialist for lifelong. The frequency of follow-up will depend in what stage of disease you are, but most often you will require treatment every three months or six months, depending on what stage you are. Uh, despite having laser treatment is known to reduce the proliferation of new abnormal blood vessels which grow onto our retina. It reduces the risk of bleeding inside the eye. But yeah, in cases of very severe bleeding where despite doing laser, sometimes if the bleeding doesn't resolve or if there is a detachment of the retina, these are the patients which who might require injection uh, the, uh, even after laser. Uh, coming to our next question, can diabetes affect even in pregnancy? Yes, that is, um, this is called gestational diabetes. And again, gestational diabetes is known to have um, risk of diabetic retinopathy progression quite faster. That's why we recommend to have a diabetic retinopathy or a dilated eye examination in the first trimester of your pregnancy or at the earliest whenever you are diagnosed with gestational diabetes. Uh, we also have uh, another question, how comfortable are you using AI-based uh, diabetic retinopathy screening? Uh, we have a lot of uh, technology now, uh, artificial intelligence-based uh, software diabetic retinopathy screening. Uh, we would recommend like if you have access to a ophthalmologist, that would be the best option to go and get uh, tested. But if you do not have an access to an ophthalmologist to get a screening, then yes, AI based screening do give very good uh, results, at least to be able to pick up preferable diabetic retinopathy or vision threatening uh, or sight threatening diabetic retinopathy. Uh, today, we have a lot of AI models which have uh, given more than 95% sensitivity to be able to pick up uh, diabetic retinopathy. So it's uh, better get detected with AI rather than not getting your screening done at all. Uh, but yes, uh, it's still a technology which is in evolution and progress. Uh, coming to our last talk of the day uh, by Ms. Uh, Rebecca Johnson, uh, who is a psychologist at Mind Matters in Shankarai Hospital. Uh, she has completed her master's in clinical psychology from Christ uh, University in Bangalore and has been working at Shankara for a year now. 
Over to you, Ms. Uh, Rebecca Johnson. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to all. So um, we were hearing about um, the condition and how to manage and what are the uh, ways in which you can come in for consultation as well. Um, I have a different approach here. I'm talking, going to be talking about coping with uh, chronic illness. Um, especially when we are talking about World Diabetes Day, the uh, theme in itself was to educate. Right. So it calls to, um, you know, increase the access of education and quality of education and also uh, the access of facilities that people should be aware of. That's what the focus by um, uh, World Health Organization is also for this year. So when we talk about uh, chronic illness, when you're diagnosed with any chronic illness, the first thought that we have is, oh, no, uh, is it forever? Is it normal or by me? So these are some of the thoughts that really come uh, to our minds. Um, and it is also important to know that it, it is normal to have these thoughts because it is uh, the first, like the initial diagnosis that you're uh, hearing about. So it's completely normal to have these thoughts. Uh, it's what, um, you know, we do about it is what actually matters. And that's something that I would be also talking about. So when we look at mental health and physical health, uh, they go hand in hand. And um, when we look at it um, from a perspective of physical health, if there is any injury or if we are hurt, it also affects our mood, um, our behavior as well. And similarly, when our uh, mood is affected, it also tends to uh, affect our physical health as well. So that's why it's important to uh, understand that they go hand in hand and any difficulties with our physical health will impact our mental health as well. So talking from a psychological perspective, I would be focusing on how diabetes as a chronic illness would be affecting our mental health and how we can cope with it. Right. Uh, so when we look at it, uh, we should also understand that chronic illness is uh, something that can cause a patient uh, at a risk. Uh, to a downward spiral in which the patient may stop keeping up with the treatment and other self-care such as diet and exercise and it can also cause further difficulties. So um, as we know that people are different in their behavior in their from their experiences as well, so they will naturally respond differently as well when they hear the initial diagnosis. So some might surrender their hope, uh, they might feel helpless. Uh, some would be determined to do all that is needed to maintain their uh, and or improve their health. And some might even find a silver lining to the diagnosis. So uh, accepting the diagnosis can be in different ways for different people. But it is important to acknowledge that, yes, it is an initial shock, an initial grief that you feel, uh, sometimes even anger because of the lifestyle changes that one has to make. So understanding that these are common, that they are actually felt uh, by people, and it is not something that we need to um, brood over and just sit with it. We can uh, acknowledge and we can take the next step to understand it better and to take uh, the necessary precautions slash treatments as well. Um, living with a chronic illness can be definitely stressful, uh, but there are definitely steps that one can take to manage the condition and maintain a good quality of life. After the diagnosis, like I mentioned, there would be the shock, the denial as well. Uh, that would be the first step. The second step is actually to go slow. Uh, it's not like we have to figure out or fix everything overnight and by next morning we should be uh, ready with a plan as to what we have to do and uh, where we have to go, etc. So we can take a moment to understand what all are the resources that we have, what are we equipped with, what can we do, what is the necessary step that we have to take. So it's important to not just act, it's important to actually plan and then act, right? Um, also, um, when we look at um, how to cope with uh, chronic illness, it's important to firstly acknowledge the emotions that we are feeling, because unless we uh, do that, we would be in denial. Uh, if we say that I'm not feeling angry, I'm not feeling sad about my diagnosis, then it's uh, probably not being true to ourselves. Right? So it's important that we are able to understand that, yes, this is how it is. Uh, this is how I'm feeling. What is it that I need to do 
to be able to help myself right so the first and the very important one is to ask questions and here the critical aspect is to ask questions to an expert because if we have a lot of questions we obviously tend to go to our internet which gives us um, immense knowledge immense um, information about any condition but how much of it is apt for us how much of it is correct and specific to our condition is important to understand therefore when we say ask questions it is to ask to an expert that is your doctor your physician right and uh, it might feel that we are burdening them with a lot of questions but it they are at your disposal so it's important that we use this opportunity to make a list of all the doubts that we have all the queries that we have and then go uh, with that and ask them with to the expert so this will not create confusion uh, and if we ask a lot of other people they might share from their experience which might cause confusion which might lead to frustration as well so it's important to make sure that we ask the right question to the right person the next is to uh, manage stress uh stress is something that we all can face in different situations but when it comes to especially uh, a chronic illness right it talks about um, you know different aspects how are we to cope with it what are we supposed to do now what is it that i can do what is it that i cannot do right so it is important to um understand that uh, there are these changes that are going to come about and sometimes we don't like the change uh there are certain lifestyle changes that we need to do uh, we need to adapt to certain uh, uh lifestyle changes so it becomes a little too much for us because we're not used to it right and sometimes we're not even sure if it's going to work for us so we have that um ambiguity in our mind that apprehension in our mind to start off with it right so it's important to be able to manage that stress because we have a lot of thoughts and emotions when we think about it so it's important to plan it out right so when we manage when we talk about managing stress it stress it's important to plan it out to see what are we worried about uh, what is it that we can control right when we talk about what we can control uh, that is going to the physician continuing the treatment being able to do uh, what is required for our um, good quality life right so all those are things which are in our control so making a list and planning it out is very important initially all things take time all things take some getting used to so it's important to keep ourselves motivated and also as probably caregivers and if you know somebody uh, going through the same situation it's easy to motivate them and share your experience how you felt that initially it was difficult but after you keep going through the same process again and again it becomes a routine so then uh, that obviously encourages the other person as well and encourages you also so it's important that we have that networking also that we um, also understanding that you know there is specificity for every uh, case and also just to share and be supportive of each other during this time another thing when we talk about is that anxiety is common when we talk about stress because we do not know what might happen what can happen right uh, another way we can manage specifically stress or we can cope with a chronic illness is by being proactive when we talk about being proactive is to follow the treatment plan and lead a healthy lifestyle uh when we talk about being proactive uh we covered the part where treatment was important so whatever your physician your doctor uh, advises you to follow through with that if there is any difficulty um following you can obviously go back to them ask them questions help them to be um, you know educate you more about it also secondly another way we can be proactive is by uh, physical activity so physical activity is something which has been effective in improving uh, not just physical health uh, especially when we look at controlling diabetes but also effective in improving mental health so like in the initial when i started talking i talked about how mental health and physical health go hand in hand so especially when we have something such as physical activity doing something that you like all this will help us um uh, be more focused uh, be able to understand what um we like and be able to do that as well for ourselves and also get that uh, 
our minds a little deviated from the condition that we are going through because the more we uh, think about it the more we are um, uh, questioning it the more it affects our mental health and our mood as well right so since everything is interrelated it's important not just to take care of our physical health but also to take care of our mental health and just to conclude i just wanted to say that um it we should never feel that we are alone because there are people who are going through the same condition there might be differences but you are not alone there is help that you can access in terms of going to a hospital getting yourself checked up also if there is any distress that you're feeling that you feel you want to talk it out please uh, we would advise suggest that you talk it out to a professional such as a mental health practitioner or a psychologist so that's it from my end uh, thank you so much uh thank you rebecca thank you for bringing in such a positive approach uh, to it the mental health is um i would totally agree that it is often neglected uh many people uh, are not open to bring about and talk about their problems but yes definitely speaking to a psychologist or uh, open up to your friend or your uh, family members with whom you are close to that will definitely help to bring a positive approach uh, and improve the mental health of these patients who suffer from chronic illness um to bring in uh, uh to bring in a nutshell uh, of all the discussions that we had today uh, we would like to emphasize that uh, the basic points on uh who needs diabetic retinopathy screening every diabetic patient requires whether it's a type 1 or a gestational diabetic or a type 2 diabetic every diabetic person requires a uh, retinal checkup how often do you require a retinal checkup it's every year uh, if you are not diagnosed with a diabetic retinopathy at least an annual checkup is definitely mandated and suggested and once you are diagnosed with a diabetic retinopathy how to go about it what are the next steps discuss with your doctor find out at what stage of diabetic retinopathy you are like how uh, ms sri lakshmi has had explained today uh, diabetic retinopathy affects dif in different stages and uh, it can cause either swelling in the central part of your retina which we call as macular edema which requires multiple injections Uh, or it may affect that your retina is not receiving enough blood supply and is forming new blood vessels uh, which is called the proliferative stage or the pdr stage where you would be recommended to undergo laser in multiple treatment sessions or if uh, you have been diagnosed in a late stage where uh, there may be bleeding inside the eye or there is retinal detachment inside the eye then you might be advised to undergo a retina surgery which is called a vitrectomy surgery so uh, kindly do not neglect on this diabetic uh, world diabetes day uh, with the theme of uh, access to education we would uh, as caregivers um, try to recommend that each one of you if you are a diabetic kindly go for a retinal evaluation and seek uh, treatment as early as possible thank you so much uh, uh, i would also like to thank our team ms bhavya mr dev ms sri lakshmi and these wonderful talks and educating these uh, uh, educating and bringing about the awareness on diabetes on world diabetes day thank you one and all Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. Ma